The story kicks off with two siblings, Hayes and Ray Lisbon, on a quest to find their family's old mansion in the middle of nowhere. These two have had a rough go of it lately. They've lost everything in a war and economic mess. Their dad just died leaving them in debt, their mom's a wreck, and their brother got scammed out of all his money. To top it off, they've been kicked out of their home. As they travel, Hayes is making big promises to Ray about fixing everything and living like royalty. Ray's kind of zoned out, and Hayes has to snap her back to reality. He starts complaining about how weird it is for their supposedly fancy family to have a house in such a remote spot. Ray tells him to zip it when they get there. They bicker for a bit, with Ray bringing up how Hayes is the reason she can't read. When Hayes raises his hand, Ray flinches, thinking he's about to hit her again. She's feeling pretty trapped and just wants to listen to the rain. When they finally arrive, Hayes gets into it with their driver, who won't take them any further because of the rain. Ray tries to get Hayes to come inside, but he's too busy threatening the driver. They walk up to this huge building, and Hayes starts pounding on the gate like a maniac. Ray thinks they might be in the wrong place, but Hayes keeps at it until some guy comes out. Hayes gets all nervous and introduces himself, fumbling around for some letter he's supposed to have. The guy's not having it, saying he's never heard of any Lisbons and they need to scram. That's when Ray steps in with the letter, begging the guy to pass it on to his grace. After giving Ray the stink eye, the guy finally lets them in. Hayes, being his charming self, starts bossing the guy around about rooms and baths. Ray's just sighing, but then the guy surprises her by offering her clothes and bath stuff too. She says she wants to see his grace first, noticing the guy suddenly being nice. He takes one look at her raggedy appearance and questions her choice. Ray asks him to deliver the letter first, all while noticing how amazing the food smells in this place. The master of the house suddenly appears, coming down the stairs and eyeing Ray in a way that makes everyone uncomfortable. The guy who let them in introduces Hayes and Ray, mentioning the letter they brought. The master reads it and sees the name Elliot Wester. Hayes jumps in to explain that Elliot was their grandpa who died last year, and apparently he'd helped out the master's family way back when. Hayes goes on about their family's recent troubles and how they need a place to crash for a bit. But the master isn't really listening. He's too busy checking out Ray, even asking if she's single. It's like he's fallen for her right then and there. He walks right up to Ray to ask her himself. When she says she's not engaged, he grins and tells them they can stay as long as they want. Hayes, feeling awkward, asks for the master's name. Turns out it's Cloden Cassell. A week goes by and Ray's thinking about how it hasn't stopped raining since they got to the castle. She notices that the longer they're cooped up inside, the worse things get between her and Hayes. They barely talk anymore, and Hayes, who used to be pretty lively, is losing his spark. The castle staff doesn't cater to Hayes' picky eating habits, and they ignore all his requests, big or small. Hayes keeps finding things to complain about. He's not happy with the number of servants. There's only Lady Mary in the kitchen, Philip the butler, Jack who takes care of the barn, and some gardener living separately. These four aren't exactly friendly and they treat Hayes like he's trash on the street. Hayes, being his loud and proud self, can't stand the disrespect. Hayes also gripes about Cloden, the master of the house. Cloden tries to be accommodating, but isn't exactly warm and fuzzy. He seems chill, but there's a clear line between him and everyone else. During their first breakfast together, he even warns them to stay off the third floor. At that same breakfast, Hayes pitches a business idea to Cloden, who surprisingly agrees, but with a catch. Hayes has to pay him back if it flops. After that, Hayes is always out and about, leaving Ray alone in the castle most of the time. She's kind of jealous of him. Hayes graduated from a fancy school and knows a lot of people. He's got a big ego, but his outgoing personality draws people to him. Ray, on the other hand, feels like she's stuck on her own little island. The castle is always super quiet, Ray can hardly hear the servants moving around, so she spends most of her time staring out the window. But she doesn't mind the silence. It's actually the peace and quiet she's been craving. 
No more money lenders barging into their house. No more mom constantly begging the grandparents for help. No more cousins talking trash about their family behind their backs. For once, everything is calm and drama-free. One day, Ray's just chilling by the window when this woman comes up to her, asking if she's cold and needs a blanket. Ray says no thanks, but the woman keeps staring at her, so Ray has to ask if there's something else on her mind. The woman starts grumbling, wondering why someone like Ray is in a place like this. Ray's confused, what's she mean, a place like this? The woman goes on about how Ray's still pure and untainted, warning her that everyone in the manor is just waiting to take advantage of her. She grabs Ray's hand, getting all dramatic about how Ray's going to lose her parents early and her brother's future isn't looking too hot either. Then she drops this bomb about the castle being cursed. She tells Ray not to take anything from anyone here, not even a glass of water. She's all, don't make eye contact and don't give away your body or your heart. Ray's trying to shake her off, but the woman's not letting go. She asks Ray if she wants to end up like her, then starts going on about some beast who's got his eye on Ray, saying she shouldn't trust him. Just then, the master shows up, calling out the woman's name and telling her she's freaking out their guest. The woman backs off, but not before telling Ray to watch out for herself and even the master. Ray's feeling awkward and apologizes for causing a scene, but the master's more interested in why she's there when he told her to stay off the third floor. He starts flirting, saying how nice it is to see her looking pretty, and invites her to join him upstairs. He promises she won't be bored. Ray reminds him that he told her not to come up, but he just teases her, asking if she's trying to seduce him. Then he's all, since you've got nothing better to do, and reaches out his hand, inviting her up to the third floor. Ray heads upstairs to meet Cloden, taking in all the fancy old furniture and artwork along the way. It's like stepping into a time capsule. They end up at a door, and Cloden shows her into what she realizes is a secret room with no windows. The whole place smells like him, a mix of cigar smoke and something weirdly innocent and youthful. While she's busy sniffing the air, Cloden asks if she likes it. Caught off guard, she blurts out that the room's nice and tidy. He grabs her hand and tells her he only brings things he likes up here, then hands her a book. Ray's staring at the book, thinking about how she can't read it, when Cloden asks if she's read it before. She tries to change the subject, asking if he likes storybooks. He wonders if she doesn't like the book because she's barely looked at it, or if she thinks it's too childish. Ray's wishing she could just tell him she can't read. With him standing so close, she finds herself thinking about kissing him. She gets up the nerve to ask him to read to her, and he grins and agrees. As he's about to start, Ray's surprised by their position. She thought he'd sit next to her, but instead she's on his lap with his arms around her. Her heart's racing so loud she thinks he might hear it. He runs his fingers through her hair and kisses her neck, telling her to be patient while he reads. Ray finally speaks up about feeling uncomfortable, but when she explains it's because he's behind her, he just holds her tighter. He says she's the one who can't focus on the book. Ray's thinking she shouldn't be doing this with him, but she can't bring herself to stop. In fact, she wants more. Suddenly, someone calls out that Hayes is back and wants to see Cloden downstairs. Ray panics, thinking about how her brother can never see her like this. Ray realizes her brother's in the castle's the castle and figures he's looking for her. She's about to get up, but Cloden holds her tighter. Someone asks if they should tell Hayes he can't see Cloden, but Cloden says he'll be down soon. Ray jumps up, but Cloden grabs her again, offering to lend her the book. She pretends to like it, still hiding that she can't read. They leave the room, and Ray notices it's stopped raining. Cloden asks if she likes warm weather. She says yeah, explaining how falling asleep in the sun feels like having a good dream. She asks him the same, but before he can answer, Hayes starts yelling. Hayes is mad, asking why she's coming down from upstairs. He rants about her ruining things for them, but Cloden cuts in, saying he invited Ray to lend her a book. Hayes snaps, calling Ray illiterate. Ray's hurt, but tries to brush it off, telling herself she's used to Hayes's insults. He orders her downstairs and accuses her of lying to Cloden. This hits her hard, 
and when Cloden says her name, she runs to her room crying. She feels bad for not liking storybooks, thinking the real world has no magic, just sadness. Days later, Lady Mary brings Ray food and medicine. She asks if Ray's been in bed because of Cloden. Ray says it's her own fault, feeling worthless. Lady Mary assumes Ray's had a rough time and starts talking about tall men being bigger down there. Ray's shocked, remembering feeling something against her back in the secret room. Lady Mary goes on about how Cloden's changed since his private time with Ray. Ray quickly sets her straight, saying nothing happened between her and Cloden. Ray learns from Lady Mary that Cloden only invested in Hayes's business because of her. She worries they might get kicked out if it fails, but Lady Mary says that won't happen. She hints that Cloden never loses out and Ray might be the one to run away. Ray's surprised and asks if Lady Mary dislikes Cloden. Lady Mary brushes it off, saying she's just a servant. Ray mentions Della, the old lady who warned her earlier, doesn't seem to like Cloden either. Lady Mary explains Della's the master's nanny and the only one who can leave the manor freely. Before leaving, Lady Mary advises Ray not to be too hard on Cloden, suggesting it might be fate. She also warns Ray to stay in her room two days from now without explaining why. On a sunny day, Ray finally leaves her room, clutching Cloden's book. She's been sick with a fever for days, and now she's determined to apologize to Cloden for not telling him she can't read. She tries to find his room but has no luck. Suddenly, she hears groaning from behind a door. Worried, she bangs on it and eventually barges in, only to find Cloden naked and, well, you know, awkward. He tells her to leave the book and go. She tries to apologize but ends up rambling, so he kicks her out. She runs off crying, feeling hurt and confused. She wonders what she did wrong and why he's being so cruel. After a moment, she rushes back to his room, yelling and crying, bombarding him with questions. He interrupts her, asking why she's only visiting now. She explains she was embarrassed about not being able to read. To her surprise, Cloden says he doesn't care if she can read or not. He tells her she fooled him that day, and he didn't know what to think when she didn't show up after. He asks if she liked what happened between them before, and when she says yes, he starts kissing her. Ray and Cloden get intimate, despite her trying to stop him. He calls her pretty, which hits her hard. She's never heard that from her family before. Meanwhile, Hayes is trudging back to the castle, soaked and grumpy after arguing with a horseman about payment. A stranger warns him about the dangerous castle, but Hayes brushes him off rudely. As he walks, Hayes stresses about his sick mom, his sketchy business partner, and his defective goods. He's probably running low on cash, too. He finally reaches the castle, calling out, but getting no answer. He's got a gift for Ray, hoping she's not still crying in her room. Philip the butler suddenly appears, startling him. Hayes asks for dinner in his room, but Philip says dinner's over and Hayes can make his own food. This ticks Hayes off, and he starts ranting about how rudely they treat guests. He smashes a vase, telling Philip to act like a proper servant. That's when things get weird. Philip's tongue turns snake-like, warning Hayes to behave. Freaked out, Hayes remembers the farmer's warning and decides they need to leave ASAP. He searches for Ray, finally spotting her with Cloden. He tries to call out, but suddenly can't speak. It's like something's choking him. Ray and Cloden chat, not noticing Hayes. Ray asks Cloden if he'd hate her if Hayes's business fails. Cloden assures her not to worry, saying he always takes what's his. Hayes, still unable to speak, realizes Cloden never cared about the business. He was after Ray all along. Ray gets up to leave, asking Cloden to teach her more from the book tomorrow. He says he can't because of some custom where they have to stay in their rooms on a certain day. Ray's curious about this tradition that everyone seems to hate. Cloden tells her not to let him in if he comes to her room that day, which only makes her more curious. Cloden then notices Hayes on the ground. Hayes can't move or speak, despite Ray trying to talk to him. To mess with Hayes, Cloden gets close to Ray and kisses her hand. Hayes can only glare at them, clearly not happy about his sister being so close to Cloden. Ray quickly leaves the room. Once she's gone, Cloden snaps his fingers, freeing Hayes. He asks about Hayes' business, but Hayes just keeps telling him to let Ray go. Cloden asks where she'd go, and Hayes says he plans to marry her off next spring. This gets a scary look from Cloden, leaving Hayes shaking in fear. 
Meanwhile, Ray's in her room thinking about what happened. She thought Hayes was going to yell at her but held back because of Cloden. She doesn't know Hayes couldn't actually speak or move. Lady Mary comes in to remind Ray about staying in her room from midnight until tomorrow evening. She's relieved Cloden told Ray about this custom himself. Ray asks if there's a problem, but Lady Mary says no and offers to bring her food the next day so she doesn't wander around. After Lady Mary leaves, Ray can't help thinking how weird it is that everyone's being so mysterious about this custom. The castle's custom of staying in your room on a certain day seems really weird to Ray. Everyone gives different reasons for it. On that day, it's dead silent. No sweeping, no people, not even a mouse. Ray figures maybe they're not telling her the whole truth because she's a guest, or they just don't think she needs to know. But besides this weird rule, she's happy with the tasty desserts, learning to read, and how Cloden looks at her like she's the most beautiful person ever. Just as she's about to sleep, her brother Hayes starts banging on her door, yelling for her to open up. She's confused. Did she do something wrong? Is he mad about her getting close to Cloden? When she opens the door, Hayes barges in crying. He grabs her, saying they need to leave the castle right now. Ray's freaked out and confused, but Hayes just keeps pulling her along. She asks if he lost Cloden's investment money, but Hayes says the money wasn't worth anything anyway. This shocks Ray, and she demands to know what he did with it. Hayes slaps her, furious that she's talking back to him. Then he drops a bomb. He asks if she really thinks Cloden has feelings for her. He tells her the castle is actually the devil's den, and Cloden is the master of all the monsters there trying to swallow her up whole. Ray doesn't buy Hayes's wild story. She thinks he's either drunk or trying to dodge blame for messing up his business again. She refuses to leave, which only makes Hayes angrier. He tries to convince her she's been fooled, but she just tells him to go apologize to Cloden. Ray likes it at the castle and doesn't want to leave. Hayes insists everyone's trying to eat her up, but she's not having it. Frustrated, Hayes grabs her hand and starts dragging her to the door. He pulls the I'm your legal guardian card and says it's their only chance to escape. Ray's still resisting when Hayes suddenly sees a creepy figure that Ray can't see. This freaks him out so much that he bolts, leaving Ray behind. Ray's left sitting on the floor, stunned. She's worried Cloden will hate her now. She realizes the happiness she felt here was never meant to last. Her brother's business was doomed from the start. As she's wallowing, Cloden shows up. Ray starts apologizing for Hayes and offers to work off his debt. But Cloden's annoyed that she keeps talking about her brother. He says she's acting like Hayes is her husband or something. Cloden kneels down and grabs her chin. He's angry that she won't stop talking about Hayes, saying it makes him want to puke. Ray's never seen him this mad before. She keeps apologizing, but Cloden tells her to stop mumbling. He reminds her that she wasn't supposed to leave her room. Then he grabs her, pushes her onto the bed, and starts kissing her. He tells her he wanted to ruin her earlier, but now he can't hold back anymore. After their intimate moment, Cloden watches Ray sleep, feeling he can't let her go anymore. The next morning, Lady Mary's tending to Ray in Cloden's room. She scolds him for being too rough, saying Ray's just a normal girl. Cloden argues it's impossible to be gentle, doubting Lady Mary could hold back either. She suggests leaving Ray alone for a while, worried about what's coming for the girl. Cloden suddenly groans, and Lady Mary drops to the floor, coughing and begging forgiveness. It's like Cloden's controlling her with some dark power. Ray wakes up and sees this, but Cloden just smirks at her. Ray's weirded out by his smile and mentions Lady Mary's yelling. Cloden gets angry, thinking she's avoiding him. He suggests she eat, acting like nothing happened with Lady Mary. Ray's confused. She seems to be the only one bothered by what just went down. She insists on helping Lady Mary, but suddenly the cook's back on her feet, like nothing happened. Ray wonders if she imagined it all. Cloden jokes about firing Lady Mary, saying Ray's defense makes him jealous. He tells Ray to be careful what she says around him. They talk, and he urges her to give in to him, saying they'll get along great as lovers if she does. Ray notices a piece of jewelry Cloden made for her ankle. She wants to do something for him, but feels she has nothing to offer. 
he reminds her that giving in to him is enough, which she agrees to. This surprises Clodan. He thinks she should be slapping him and running away after what he put her through. Instead, she's embracing this vicious beast. He likes her, but finds it annoying, too. We learn that long ago, Cloden was cursed by his godfather with eternal life, turning him into a monster trapped in the castle forever. The man who cursed Cloden died right after casting the spell. Cloden thought he'd break the curse quickly, but nothing worked. Now he's the last wizard in the world. As a kid, Cloden's godfather told him he was the last wizard, but kept the source of his power secret. Turns out, this power was infinite. Once Cloden found out, he wanted it all for himself. No matter what he tried, the curse stuck. It even made him feel like he was going through heat cycles, like an animal. The curse affected everyone around him too, slowly killing them. Now he can't even leave the castle. He's like a chained up beast. In his room looking miserable, Philip asks if Cloden's body is acting up again. Cloden just asks about Ray instead. He learns she's having a picnic in the garden and tells Philip to leave her be. During the picnic, Ray wishes Cloden could join them, but Lady Mary says he's super busy. When Lady Mary goes to get more water, Ray offers some sandwiches to the gardener. Later, the gardener heads to the basement and meets Philip. Philip's surprised when the gardener speaks. He hasn't heard the guy talk in 50 years. The gardener's there to say Ray wants blue roses. Philip warns the gardener to be careful, or he'll end up like Hayes, who apparently doesn't have long to live. Hayes is freaking out, begging to see Cloden. He says a ship's coming soon and he'll be able to pay his debt, or he'll borrow money if that's too long to wait. Philip shuts him down, saying no one will listen to him looking like he does now. He hands Hayes a mirror, and Hayes screams at his reflection. He demands they change his face back, but Philip says curses can't be undone. Philip's not thrilled about having a newbie like Hayes around. He shows off his snake-like tongue and explains he's been taking care of the master since he was young. He tried to run away once, and this is what happened. Everyone in the castle is cursed and owes the master something. Philip warns Hayes to give up on escaping or he'll turn into a full-on monster if he leaves. The gardener asks the master for help making blue roses for Ray. The master agrees, handing over some potions, knowing it's all for Ray. Ray's finished all her books and is thinking about Cloden. She hasn't seen him in days but doesn't want to bother him. It starts raining and she spots something outside. She grabs an umbrella and runs out to see Blue Roses. She's amazed, always thinking they didn't exist. The gardener sneaks up on her, speaking for the first time. He says the roses are a thank you for her sandwiches. Lady Mary yells at Ray to come inside. Ray promises to explain things to Lady Mary and thanks the gardener. Inside, Ray tells Lady Mary she just tripped. Lady Mary glares outside, asking if Ray's trying to kill her. Meanwhile, Cloden's restless in his room, thinking about Ray. He even sniffs the clothes she wore in his room. While Ray's showering, she asks Lady Mary if she's feeling better. Lady Mary's confused, so Ray mentions her being sick recently. Lady Mary brushes it off, saying it's no big deal. Ray offers to ask Cloden for a carriage so Lady Mary can see a doctor in the city. Lady Mary says she can't remember the last time she went out, then starts asking questions from way back. Ray thinks Lady Mary acts like she's from another time. After the shower, Ray's about to sleep when Clodon grabs her, asking why she's late. He falls asleep right away, leaving Ray lost in thought. Next morning, Ray has a nightmare about a snake with Clodon's eyes trying to eat her. She wakes up panicked. Clodon initiates another intimate moment, despite her protests. Later, they're having a picnic in the garden. Ray's still mad about yesterday, but Clodon blames her for tempting him. He starts touching her again, but she warns him to stop. Clodon offers to get her food. Ray's touched, saying he's sweet for coming out despite hating the weather. She says no one's ever done that for her before. She remembers her mom teaching her not to bother people, but Clodon does things she likes even when he doesn't want to. That's why she likes him. Clodon's surprised. Ray asks if there's anything he hates that she can do for him. He says she'll spoil him if she keeps this up. Ray insists she means it. Cloden asks, anything, while holding her chin. Ray kisses his hand, saying she'll do anything he asks. Cloden's inner thoughts are a mess. Every time Ray shows vulnerability or love, he feels like he's cracking. 
He only knows how to take what he wants, not how to be vulnerable. He wonders if avoiding the curse would have made things different. For the first time, he's actually regretting his past. Birds snapping him out of his thoughts, Cloden suddenly looks sick. Ray asks if he's okay, but he just starts touching her again. He says it's too late for him to be good now, so he'd rather make Ray like him instead. Meanwhile, Philip and Lady Mary are releasing Hayes from the basement. They're not setting him free, just bringing him up to say his greetings. Hayes thinks he can take them down easily. One old man and a middle-aged lady shouldn't be a problem. He's planning to push them down the stairs and escape. But before he can act, Lady Mary tells him his new name is John. Hayes insists he's Hayes Lisbon, but she says that person doesn't exist anymore. She warns him not to act cocky around the master or he'll regret it. Hayes yells for explanations, but they ignore him. He's furious at being treated like garbage. While Philip and Lady Mary whisper in the corner, Hayes considers escaping. Suddenly, he hears Ray's voice in a nearby room, talking to Cloden. He's shocked to hear his sister having a romantic moment with Cloden. He thinks she's been fawning over this monster while he was locked up. He rushes in to confront her, but realizes he's under a spell. He can't say what he wants, only what the spell allows. Worst of all, Ray doesn't even recognize him anymore. Hayes is baffled that Ray doesn't recognize him. Even as a monster, shouldn't she know her own brother? Philip steps in, introducing him as John, a new servant. Ray greets him politely, leaving Hayes stunned. As they leave, Hayes thinks about Lady Mary's warnings, which he'd brushed off. He's determined to get Ray on his side to escape, convinced that even Clodon must have a weakness. Later, Ray finds a childhood photo of Cloden. He tells her about his past. Parents died in an accident, distant godfather, overprotective nanny, and people who ignored his behavior. He says he only remembers the bad parts and had no enjoyable childhood memories. Cloden gets flirty, saying life's been exciting since Ray arrived. They start kissing, with Ray worried someone might see. Lady Mary walks in and drops her tray, but Cloden uses magic to keep it floating. He assures Ray no one's around while Lady Mary sneaks away. They continue their intimate moment around the castle. Ray gets thirsty and asks for water. While drinking, she hears John's voice outside, reminding her of Hayes. She wonders how her brother's doing, remembering their desperate arrival at the castle with just a letter. Ray muses about how things have changed. It was Hayes's idea to come here, but now he's gone and she's Clodan's lover. Life's unpredictable. She turns to Clodan, curious about how he knew their grandfather, since he let them in based on just a letter. Clodan's a bit thrown off by Ray's questions in the middle of their intimate moment. He remembers meeting Elliot Wester 50 years ago, when the guy showed up at the castle on a rainy day, asking to wait it out. Over dinner, Clodan mentioned he'd heard of Elliot before, some noble family guy. Elliot was all excited about his pregnant wife. Clodan, being weirdly psychic, told Elliot it'd be a girl. He also dropped the bomb that Elliot's wife was sick and might not make it. Clodan offered a deal. He'd help the wife have a healthy baby if Elliot promised to send the girl to him when she grew up. Elliot was freaked out at first, thinking it was a joke, but he admitted he came looking for medicine for his wife. He agreed to the deal, just wanting his daughter to be born healthy. Elliot was the first person to leave the manor alive. His life was perfect after that, healthy daughter and all. But that promise came back to bite him and the curse got passed down until it hit Ray. Back in the present, after Ray's asleep, Cloden's thinking he only knows how to take what he wants. That's why Ray's with him now. Next day, Lady Mary's in the kitchen, still shocked about catching Cloden and Ray in the corridor. Ray shows up, asking if it's normal for lovers to make out so much. Lady Mary thinks to herself that Ray's expectations are just fantasy when it comes to Cloden. She tells Ray it's normal for newlyweds, especially when they're in love. She suggests Ray ask Cloden for new shoes. Lady Mary knows Ray's normal life is over now that Cloden's got her. His obsession is getting worse daily. If Ray ever breaks up with him or leaves, it'll be a disaster, and the servants will take the hit. Ray's got the power now, and if anything goes wrong with her, it'll be bad news for everyone. Lady Mary's on a mission, searching for Cloden. She asks Philip where he is and heads to his study.
she's been up all night, wrestling with a decision. Before Ray can run away and the servants take the fall, she needs to step in. She's hoping for some peace in the manor, but as she walks to Cloden's room, she's still questioning if this is the right move. She enters to find Ray fast asleep on Cloden. Lady Mary mentions Ray only has one pair of shoes, suggesting they get her a new pair. Cloden, lost in thought, tells Lady Mary to keep doing what she's doing, listening to Ray's silly ramblings and her concerns. He wants Ray to have someone to lean on, especially with her brother gone. As Lady Mary's about to leave, Cloden orders her to tell Philip to get the carriage ready. Later, Lady Mary's rushing Ray to get dressed. She's brushing Ray's hair when Ray asks if they're having guests. Lady Mary says Ray's going to town with Cloden. Ray's thrilled but quickly asks about her brother. Lady Mary says she hasn't heard anything and keeps brushing. Outside, Cloden's waiting, looking sharp in his fancy clothes. Ray runs to hug him, her excitement obvious. Nearby, Philip's ordering John to tie up the horse. John grumbles that he doesn't know how, and their argument catches Ray's attention. She thinks John sounds just like Hayes. As they're about to leave, John signals Ray through the window, pointing to the woodpiles. Ray wonders why he wants her to meet him there. During the ride, Ray notices something weird about the carriage. Cloden says the horse is specially trained, but he's actually using magic to control it. Cloden tells Ray they're going shoe shopping. Ray feels bad she never gives him anything back. She's sad she has nothing to offer, even though she wants to return his love. Cloden squeezes her hand, saying, it sounds like she's only with him because she owes him. He admits he knew Hayes couldn't pay him back and only helped to impress Ray. He teases that money isn't important, and it all worked out since she's sitting on his lap now. In town, Ray's frowning as she gets out of the carriage. Clodan suggests they take their time looking around. A few hours later, they're eating, and Ray's grateful for all the gifts, though she thinks it's too much. Clodan says it's not enough for someone he likes. Ray suggests heading home after eating, but Clodon says they have one more stop. Suddenly, Ray finds herself at an inn. She's surprised, wondering when Clodon had time to plan this detour. For Ray, love is this crazy new feeling she's only heard about from others. She never thought it'd hit her like this. They spend a long time being intimate. Later, Clodon wakes up first and watches Ray sleep. He's daydreaming about their future kids having her hair. Then he catches himself a cursed dad who can't even take his kids to the park. He wonders how long it'll take Ray to figure out what's really going on. That night, Philip and Lady Mary see Cloden coming back in the carriage. Philip's amazed. He's seen Cloden use magic before, but never this much for so long. He's worried it might be wearing Cloden out. Cloden carries a sleeping Ray inside, brushing off Lady Mary's help to undress Ray himself. As Lady Mary's leaving, Cloden says something weird. He wishes he could be normal. He's never felt like this before, and now he's obsessing over breaking the curse. Lady Mary mentions everyone in the manors dreamed of that. Cloden used to try breaking the curse, then gave up and just made painkillers. Now he's back at it, even though he knows it's hopeless. Next day, Lady Mary's getting Ray's outfit ready. Ray's thinking about her trip with Cloden. He's busy with work again, and she's back to her usual routine. The only difference is Cloden's sending gifts every day. Ray's staring at the dresses, looking glum. It's not that she doesn't like them. She's just thinking they probably cost more than what Hayes owes Cloden. Lady Mary tries to cheer her up, saying Cloden would buy a whole dress shop for her if she wanted. She says other ladies would be jealous. Ray suddenly asks where Cloden is. She hasn't seen him in days. Turns out, all this dressing up is for afternoon tea with him. Later, Ray brings Cloden snacks. She heard weird noises from his room and asks if he's okay. She spots his bleeding hand, but he brushes it off. She wants to go in his room, but he says it's dangerous because of broken glass. Ray gets mad, thinking he's hiding something. She yells at him, and the food plate crashes to the floor. As she bends to pick it up, she's kicking herself, wondering what she just did. She quickly backtracks, feeling like she's bothering him and should let him get back to work. He grabs her, insisting she's not annoying him at all. Unsure what to do, she says she's leaving to have the mess cleaned up. He asks if she's running away, and she explains she's just getting someone to sweep up the glass. 
He tells her it's okay if she yells at him or gets mad, but he can't stand it when she tries to leave. He admits he's known for his temper, especially when working, which is why people usually steer clear. He curses and asks for forgiveness, but she sees it differently. She starts explaining how sweet and encouraging he can be, not realizing how much it means to her. He says it's because he likes her. This surprises her, and she wonders if his feelings might change. He says she should be more concerned about him falling even harder for her. As they talk, he notices she seems off today. When she tries to explain, she accidentally touches his injured hand. He asks her to treat it, and while she does, he just stares at her, complimenting how beautiful she looks and asking if she dressed up for him. She ignores this and turns away. Seeing her mood, he explains that just like she wants to look nice for him, there are parts of himself he'd rather not show her. She worries he might change and stop liking her, but he assures her that won't happen. If anything, he's the one who hopes she won't change. She shares that her love has always been one-sided, and she never expected him to like her back. It's a first for her, so why would she ever want to change? He hugs her, thinking to himself that this feels like a spell he never wants to break. Later, on a sunny afternoon, Ray's in the garden checking out the huge blue roses and looking for the gardener. She hears rustling behind the flowers and thinks she's found them, but it turns out to be John. He uses her last name, which is weird since everyone else calls her Ray. She says hi, but he starts going on about how normal people can't grow flowers like these. He crushes some and says blue roses don't exist. Maybe only a monster could make something like this. John's rambling gets cut short when Jack the gardener smacks him with a stick and starts beating him up. Ray tries to stop it, but Jack keeps going. He wonders if Ray figured out the truth from what John said earlier. Even while getting pummeled, John keeps talking big about knowing Jack's tricks. Meanwhile, Philip's giving the master his medicine inside the castle. The curse's side effects usually get worse during full moons, but it's happening early this time. Philip thinks it's because the master used too much magic. He's glad they have medicine to help with his temper, and awkwardly mentions that the master probably made it because of Ray. Without her, there'd likely be blood spilled in the manor by now. The master suddenly tosses Philip a key, telling him to keep it safe. He explains it's for a special door lock. You can leave from inside, but no one can enter from outside. It's to keep Ray safe. As he's giving more instructions about the key, Lady Mary knocks and tells him about the commotion in the garden. They all rush out. The master asks Ray if she got in a fight, but she says Jack stopped things before they got too serious. When he asks why she was with the servants, she says she wanted to help since everyone's busy. He grabs her hand, telling her she doesn't need to do that. He doesn't want her touching dirt. He even threatens to cut off the gardener's wrist if she does. He reminds her he wants to give her the best of everything. Ray's caught up in her thoughts, wondering where she stands if his feelings change. She needs some connection to stay, even if that happens. Snapping out of it, she quickly says she was just looking at flowers when she ran into the servants. The master's surprised she'd look at flowers without him, which shocks Philip and Lady Mary since he's never been into that stuff. As they head back inside, the master orders Philip and Lady Mary to make sure John and Jack get proper training. Philip's relieved the master kept his cool, while Lady Mary notes their lives depend on Ray now. Philip brushes off worries about Ray leaving, saying they just need to do their jobs right. He then warns John to know his place, saying they only let things slide before because he was from a rich family. Later, during his meal, the master gets lost in daydreams about Ray. She snaps him out of it, asking if he's okay. Noticing he's sweating, she reaches for his face. Ray gets up to fetch some water and a towel for his fever. He's thinking she should run away from him, and he needs to call Lady Mary and hide until tomorrow to keep Ray safe. He wants the servant to get everything Ray needs ready. To his surprise, she comes back with the water and towel and starts cooling him down, suggesting they call a doctor. He flops onto her, saying he feels sick and thirsty. He jokes that a tiny sip would make him feel better, holding her close. When she tells him to calm down because he's sick, he teases that he just meant some ice-cold water. After messing with her for a bit, 
he tells her to go back to her room and stay there until tomorrow because of the manor's customs. She asks if that means she won't see him tonight, but he doesn't answer. When she suggests spending the night together, he quickly calls Philip and Lady Mary to take her to her room. Before she goes, he warns her not to open her door for him tonight, no matter what. She's confused, but instead of explaining, he promises to take her somewhere fun if she keeps this promise. Back in his room, Lord Cloden collapses, coughing up blood from the curse. Ray can't stop thinking about his weird request as she's being escorted. Lady Mary tries to calm her, saying the master has a plan and is doing this for her. They urge her to do as he asks. She reluctantly goes to her room, and Philip locks the door with a special key. He hopes everything goes smoothly this time. In her room, Ray thinks it's normal for Lord Cloden to be secretive, but making a promise like that seems fishy. Plus, he looked sick. She can't wait for this to be over. Meanwhile, Philip and Lady Mary can't find the master anywhere in the castle. Lady Mary fears the worst, but Philip reminds her that the master said he prepared a strong spell to protect Ray no matter what. Lady Mary still wants to check Ray's room, worried about what a starving beast might do with food right in front of it. Ray wakes up from a nightmare and gets some water. There's a knock at the door. It's Lord Cloden. He asks if she's awake, and she says she just woke up but is going back to sleep. He keeps banging on the door, saying he just wants to see her face. She reminds him of his warning not to open the door. He starts making promises about singing her a lullaby and letting her use his arm as a pillow. Ray wonders if his earlier promise was a joke, but he keeps begging to see her before bed. She firmly tells him she wants to keep their promise, but this makes things worse. He slams the door harder, demanding she open it. He even accuses her of being with someone else, like the gardener. His behavior is strange tonight. He's joked before, but never been this scary. After trying to open the door for a while, he finally gives up, saying Ray won this time. But it doesn't end there. He tries again, offering to take her to see the ocean and asking why she's being so cold by not opening the door. He suggests maybe that's just how she feels about him. Ray's more worried about the thunderstorms. When she speaks again, she notices it's suddenly quiet, like he's left. She tries to figure out what's going on, then starts crying and saying there's a misunderstanding. She expresses her love for him, but suddenly he grabs her from behind, saying maybe God didn't completely abandon him after all since he gave him her. Ray's relieved he hasn't left, but then realizes they're not in her room anymore. They're by the ocean. She's confused about how this is possible. Before she can process it, Lord Cloden gets intimate. After using his magic to take them back to the castle, Ray tells him to leave her room. When he asks why she's pushing him away, she says he's not the Cloden she knows right now. He makes a crude joke about dogs not pulling out even after they're done. The next morning, Lord Cloden wakes up wondering how he got back to his room after sending Ray back. He jumps up when he finds her next to him, remembering last night and seeming to regret what happened. Ray's having a nice dream when she feels a warm touch on her head. She wakes up to see Lord Cloden and realizes she's not undressed and her clothes feel soft. She asks where they are, why he told her not to come out, and why they were by the ocean. She's sure she never left her room, which makes everything even more confusing. He just stares at her silently, then tries to kiss her, but she covers his mouth. She surprises him by asking if he's a fairy. This reminds him he's still in heat and needs to keep his distance. He thinks to himself that spending one night with her won't solve his problem, and he feels like an animal who can't control his desires. He changes the subject, mentioning she talked about being hungry in her sleep and suggesting she eat something. She unexpectedly tells him she loves him and that he already knows everything. She lashes out, saying he made her fall for him, but she knows the least about him out of everyone in the manor. She hugs him from behind, complaining that he tricked her into opening the door, but never tells her anything. He just tells her to let go. She yells that lovers should know more about each other, but he's only thinking about how to devour her. Seeing his reaction, Ray says she hates him and doesn't want to be his lover anymore. He just says she can do as she likes, which makes her cry, realizing he's not even scared of losing her. 
She doesn't know it's the curse making him act so weird. He's trying to be careful, knowing he could hurt her badly if he loses control. Still crying, she asks what she means to him, and if he thinks she's not worth sharing anything with. He just yells at her to stop talking before he kisses her. When she asks if that's all he has to say, he stays quiet. She sadly goes back to the bed, saying she hates this place. At the castle, Lady Mary's bringing food to Ray's room when she notices all the windows in the hall are open. She panics, thinking something terrible has happened, and runs to tell Philip. She finds him outside with John and reports that Ray's gone and the windows are shattered, screaming that the master's done it again. John asks what she means and if something happened to his sister. John angrily demands to know if the master did something to his sister or is trying to turn her into a monster too. Lady Mary tells him to shut up, but he says they should just kill him and his sister instead of making them more miserable. Lady Mary laughs, asking if that's why he tried to run away and leave his sister behind. He denies it, saying he was going to come back for her once he found help. Lady Mary reveals her monster tongue and asks what he would have done if Ray became a monster while he was gone. They argue until Philip stops them, sighing that it's not the time to fight. Just then, Ray and Lord Cloden walk into the castle. Ray says she's tired and going to her room. The servants just stare, completely confused about what's going on. Mary walks into the room quietly, noticing that Ray is still trying to get ready. Without hesitation, Mary offers to help her get dressed, knowing that Ray might need the assistance. As she starts helping, Mary can't help but think about how much Cloden has changed because of his curse. It's clear that the curse has driven him mad, but she thinks that maybe it's a good thing it didn't go further because at least Ray is still able to walk on her own two feet. Mary sighs softly, keeping her thoughts to herself, knowing that it's better to say nothing. As Mary adjusts Ray's dress, Ray suddenly asks why she's always the one who's left in the dark. She questions why nobody ever tells her what's really going on. There's frustration in Ray's voice, and Mary can sense how tired she is of being kept out of the loop. But Mary doesn't let on that she understands Ray's frustration. Instead, she pretends not to know what Ray is talking about and gently reminds her of that time when she fainted because of Clodan. Mary hopes that bringing up the past will distract Ray, but she can see that Ray isn't satisfied with the answer. Mary thinks to herself that it's only a matter of time before Ray figures everything out. Even though Ray is inexperienced and a bit naive, Mary knows that Ray isn't foolish. She's bound to notice that something strange is going on in the castle, but Mary doesn't want to be the one to reveal the truth to her. She doesn't want to face the consequences that might come from being honest. So instead of telling Ray what's really happening, Mary tells her that there's been a misunderstanding. She insists that Ray fainted because of her illness and that Cloden had nothing to do with it. Mary tries to sound convincing, but she knows deep down that she's not telling the whole truth. Ray listens to Mary, but it's clear that she doesn't believe her. Suddenly, Ray's frustration boils over, and she yells at Mary. She accuses her of being just like everyone else, of keeping her in the dark on purpose. Ray says she thought Mary was different, that she expected more from her. Ray doesn't want to be kept in the dark anymore. She doesn't want to be told to keep her eyes and ears closed to everything happening around her. She's tired of being treated like she's too fragile to handle the truth. Ray tells Mary that she doesn't want to laugh it off when strange things happen, like it's nothing. She wants to know what's really going on, no matter how hard the truth might be. Ray, feeling overwhelmed, tells Mary to leave the room. She says she wants to be alone. And as she speaks, she places her face in her palms, trying to hide her frustration. Mary hesitates for a moment, but then quietly steps out of the room, softly shutting the door behind her. As she turns around, she sees Cloden standing close to the door, as if he has been waiting there. Mary tells him that Ray is upset and suggests that he try to soothe her, hoping that he can calm her down a bit. She wonders if Ray has figured out the truth about everything and asks Cloden if Ray knows what's really going on. Cloden simply replies that Ray will be okay, not giving much away with his words. Mary, wanting to believe that everything will be fine, 
reminds Cloden of how kind and innocent Ray is. She tells him that Ray would understand if he just took the time to explain everything to her. But Cloden seems doubtful. He questions what exactly he is supposed to explain to Ray. He wonders if he should tell her that he is cursed, that he turns into an animal that goes into heat because of this curse. He asks Mary if she really thinks that telling Ray this will give her any peace of mind. Mary, already feeling overwhelmed, drops to her knees, not knowing what to say. She stays silent, realizing that the truth might be too much for Ray to handle. Clodon, seeing her reaction, comments that it's probably better to keep things as they are. Mary, still wanting to protect Ray, asks Clodon what he means by that. She doesn't fully understand what he's trying to say. She asks if he really wants Ray to stay with him, despite everything. Mary is clearly worried, not just about Ray's safety, but about what the future holds if Ray remains in the dark. She hopes that Cloden will reconsider, that he will find a way to let Ray go before things get worse. But Cloden doesn't give her a clear answer, leaving Mary to wonder what will happen next. Cloden looks at Mary and states that she has a cunning side, mentioning how life has probably been easier for her lately because she's been sleeping well. He reminds her of the time he heard her humming the other day, as if to prove his point. But then, with a hint of bitterness, he adds that she must find life pretty bearable now that she's made Ray the sacrificial lamb. He accuses Mary of only caring about her own well-being, not Ray's. As he walks away from her, he coldly states that it won't do her any good to be involved with monsters like them, leaving her to absorb his harsh words. Later, at the dining table, Ray and Cloden are seated together, while the others stand quietly behind them, waiting to serve. The atmosphere is tense, and Ray seems distant, lost in her own thoughts. As dinner progresses, Ray stands up, ready to leave the table. Cloden notices and asks her if she isn't going to finish her meal. Ray, without looking at him, responds by telling Mary that starting from the next day, she would prefer to dine in her room. She says she wants to be alone, making it clear that she needs some space. The request hangs in the air, signaling that something is deeply troubling her, but she doesn't say anything more, and the room falls into a heavy silence as she leaves. Mary has never seen Ray so mad before. It worries her to see such an intense reaction, but she also knows how much Ray and Cloden desire each other. She thinks that maybe all they need is some time to cool off and work things out, but Ray doesn't want to be near Cloden anymore, and it's clear to Mary that Cloden isn't putting any effort into fixing the problem. This makes Mary even more anxious because she knows that if things keep going this way, nothing good will come of it. One day, Mary finally snaps and shouts out in frustration. Philip, who is nearby, hears her and comes over to ask why she's so upset. Mary, unable to hold back her feelings, explains that it seems like Ray has made up her mind to bury her feelings for Cloden. She's convinced that Cloden isn't going to do anything to change the situation, and Mary fears that if Ray finally leaves him, it will push Cloden over the edge. She is terrified that Cloden will end up harming both Ray and himself if things don't get better, and she is determined not to let that happen. Philip, seeing how serious Mary is, asks her if she has a plan to prevent the worst from happening. Mary, with a determined look in her eyes, gives him a firm and positive reply. She doesn't have all the details figured out yet, but she is sure of one thing. She is going to do everything she can to protect Ray and stop Cloden from making a terrible mistake. The determination in her voice makes it clear that she won't back down, no matter what it takes. Cloden asks Mary if she is the mother of two sons, and she says yes. Then, he asks her to send one of her sons to him as a guardian when they are feeling better, because they've been looking rough these past few days. When Mary's family is dying from a deadly plague, she rushes to the castle in a desperate attempt to find help. The mysterious owner of the castle shows her kindness and gives her a miraculous medicine that ends up saving her family. Her son, who couldn't even get out of bed, starts walking around again in just a few days. Mary's heart fills with gratitude for the master of the castle. Cloden asks her to send one of her sons to him, but as time goes on and her son grows up, he gets married. Mary breaks her promise to the master of the castle because she figures that it's normal for people to go back on their word. 
She thinks that the master, living in such a big castle, will be able to find others to work for him. Plus, since he was generous enough to give her the cure that saved her family, she assumes it's okay to not keep her end of the deal. However, after some time, regret starts eating away at her. She goes back to the castle, bangs on the door, and pleads for forgiveness, begging the master of the castle to help her once more. When she realizes she's been cursed, Cloden tells her that he can't help her and that she should have kept her promise. She mumbles that she never would have taken the medicine if she had known this would happen. Then, Philip comes in and asks her how long she plans on staying like that while handing her a bowl of soup. As time goes on, she starts to think that maybe her mind is getting better, or maybe she's just getting used to the pain. Working in the castle, she tells herself that she's making up for breaking her promise and that her family will be closer to God because of her sacrifice. Later, she knocks on Cloden's door, saying that she has brought some tea for Ray's cold, but Ray refuses to open the door for her. Cloden remembers Mary's earlier comment about him only caring about his own well-being and not Ray's, but all he says in response to Ray not opening the door is, So what? Even though Clodon is the one who gave up on breaking the curse, Ray is the reason he changes his mind. Mary doesn't want to let go of that, so she insists that Ray sounds like she's come down with a terrible fever. Mary doesn't care if people call her sly or cunning. For her, the line between good and evil has long been blurry. She doubts that Cloden will give up on Ray, so she says that she thinks Ray will open the door for him. As Mary walks down the stairs, she hopes they will soon make up. She thinks about how they are all lonely souls gathered inside this cursed castle. They need Lady Ray in the manor to help them free themselves from being monsters. She believes that only Ray can help them finally understand what it means to feel human. Cloden walks into room, carrying the tea that Mary prepared for her. He places the tea gently on the table. Ray, still feeling weak, apologizes and asks Cloden not to leave her alone, even though she isn't fully aware of what she's saying. After a while, Ray sits up and asks Cloden why he is there. She notices a smell and wonders if Lady Mary has stopped by. Cloden feels her forehead and says he doesn't think she has a fever. He offers her the tea to drink. Ray then mentions that her stomach hurts, her shoulders and back ache, and her legs and hands are sore too. While she's talking, Cloden leans in and kisses her. She responds to the kiss, and as they're kissing, she thinks to herself that it feels like the empty part of her heart is finally becoming full. She doesn't care if the first person who truly sees her is a monster. Even though he's sweet and kind, she wouldn't mind if he wanted to eat her. Lying unclothed on the bed with Ray, covered in a warm blanket, Cloden talks with Philip. He says he knew he'd end up in this situation, even though it took him a while to get here. Cloden admits there's nothing more he wants at the moment and asks Philip if he's having any regrets about his decision. He can sense it, feeling that the walls he's built around himself for many years are slowly starting to crumble. At first, he saw Ray as just a new toy to keep him entertained, and now he almost feels bad for keeping her captive. At the dining table, Ray thanks Mary and apologizes for yelling at her the other day. She tells Mary she really appreciates everything she has done for her. Ray insists that Mary shouldn't mention it, saying she was wrong too, and that they should move on. Ray then asks Mary if she was able to talk to Cloden, noting that she believes a good conversation can solve almost anything. Mary shakes her head and says she hasn't talked to him yet. Ray wonders if she should try talking to Cloden herself, and ends by saying she feels like a coward for not speaking to him sooner. Ray then admits that she can't answer any of her questions about the manor. She says Cloden is the only one who knows the answers, and she understands that. The more she tries to learn about Cloden and the manor, the more mysterious everything becomes. But now, being with him, the raindrops falling outside feel like a blessing, while being alone makes the sunshine seem too harsh. She finds it strange because she never thought falling in love would feel like falling into a deep hole. That's why she never wanted to get involved in the first place. Now, though, she laughs and cries because of him, and she concludes that she's already been tamed. There she is again, looking for Clodon. As she searches through the bookshelves, 
Clodon picks up a book, and she turns around, feeling happy to see him. He asks her why she is there, and she wonders what he thinks about them. She questions if she's an inconvenience to him, and if she has a place in his future. Then, she replies that the weather is nice, even though it's not the kind she usually enjoys. She adds that she started to like rainy days, too. Ray then asks Cloden why he left without waking her up. She wonders if it's normal to do that when people break up. Cloden responds by asking if she wants to break up with him, and he questions why she smiled and hugged him the day before. He says he thought about ending all the confusion and asks why she keeps coming to him like this. He admits that it drives him crazy when she takes something back that she gave him. Holding his shoulder, Ray assures him that she doesn't want to stop and that she loves him. Ray then tells Cloden that she doesn't understand why he does certain things or why he can't answer any of her questions. She realizes it might be unusual, especially since she's never relied on anyone the way she relies on him now, but she can't help but love him. She kisses him and asks him to promise that when he's ready, he will come to her and tell her everything. She tells him she will wait for him. Walking away from Clodon's room, Ray admits to herself that she has been completely honest about her feelings for the first time in her life. She hopes Clodon understands how she feels. As she lifts her face, she sees Clodon's nanny staring at her. It's the first time the nanny has appeared since she tried to scare Ray away. Ray bows to greet her and then admits that she ignored the nanny's warning. She asks the nanny if she wishes Ray would leave Cloden, and the nanny says yes. Ray then asks why. The old lady seems doubtful that Ray really doesn't know, but Ray tells her to stop talking. This makes the nanny question if Ray doesn't want to hear the truth. Ray admits she is scared to hear it and doesn't want to run away before facing the truth. She decides she will wait until Cloden tells her everything. As Ray walks away, the nanny says that Ray still has a pure soul. She adds that for some reason Ray hasn't been tainted, which seems impossible in the manor. The nanny explains that the manor is a place where all the cursed souls end up. Every once in a while they have guests visit the manor, but no matter who comes, they always end up leaving with a curse that the master of the manor puts on them. That's why she warned Ray to run away before she becomes Cloden's scapegoat. The nanny is worried about Ray and wants her to leave the manor before anything foolish or dangerous happens to her. Ray then walks into Cloden's room and asks him to confirm that Ray is indeed the youngest among the siblings who came by recently. She wants to know if Cloden has done anything to her brother lately. She reminds him that she has told him many times not to cast such curses, as it always comes back as part of his karma. Ray then stretches out a booklet toward Cloden and says it contains news she got from her recent visit outside the manor. The booklet has details about important events that have happened recently. She asks Cloden if he is willing to send Ray back, hoping he will reconsider and let her go. Cloden calls her Della and tells her to be careful with her words, saying that some people might think he kidnapped her. Ray acknowledges that he understands what she's trying to say, but tells him to stop avoiding the issue and get to the point. She says that he can't deny that he intended for her to fall for him and insists that he needs to let her go. She adds that he has to handle things on his own. Cloden responds by saying that it was never his intention to make her fall in love with him. He didn't force her to love him, but he does want her. The nanny explains that whenever Cloden wanted something for himself, he would hide it away in a secret place since he was young. She worries about what might happen if he starts developing strong feelings for a person. She reminds him that she is not cursed, as he knows. She was lucky enough to be out in town and escape the curse's wrath, which is why she's the only one who can travel outside the manor. She says she might not be a monster, but she isn't fully human either because of her connection to the manor. The nanny explains that she doesn't die, but she's not really a ghost either. It's like she's floating inside an empty shell of a body. She could disappear at any moment if she decides to leave the manor. She asks Cloden if he plans to turn Ray into someone like her. She says she doesn't want them both to end up on a path of destruction and sincerely hopes that Karma doesn't catch up with him as she walks away. 
Cloden then tells Philip not to let Della come inside the manor anymore. He says that even though he should forgive her, she won't last long outside the manor. Cloden questions if he's planning to leave her to disappear completely. He explains that it's because Della made an inappropriate comment about Ray, so Philip should make sure she never returns. Walking down the hall, Ray thinks about the nanny's words about ignoring her warning. She wonders if she should expect Cloden to change, or if some things will always stay the same, no matter how hard she tries. She feels like she might end up regretting it. She knows there's a lot happening, and although she trusts Cloden, she feels uncertain. As she is deep in thought, someone interrupts her by asking if she would like something to drink. She declines, saying she was about to head to the kitchen. John approaches and addresses her as Miss Lisbon. He asks if she's happy because he heard she has a brother, but she seems perfectly happy even without him. Ray responds that she's not sure, as it has been a while since her brother left, and she hasn't received any letters from him since he left. John tells her to look closely at him and see if he reminds her of someone. As she stares at him, she is surprised and asks if he is the one. John confirms it and asks if she recognizes him. Ray thinks he used to work at the Lisbon Manor. Mary then interrupts, saying that John seems bothered and suggests that Ray should report to Master Cloden to assign John a task. Annoyed, John walks away from Ray. Mary approaches and asks Ray if she's all right and if John said anything unusual. Ray responds that John didn't say much. Mary then offers to get Ray a drink, and Ray agrees. Ray leans to one side of the couch, holding a bottle of drink. She thinks Mary must have given her something stronger than usual, even though it's supposed to have the lowest alcohol content. The drink makes her feel relaxed and a bit lightheaded. Before she realizes it, Clodon is already by her side. Surprised, she asks when he arrived, and Clodon replies, not long ago. Sitting on Clodon's lap, Ray tells him that his lips are the prettiest thing she's ever seen. She explains that his lips were the first thing she noticed about him. As she touches his lips, they begin to kiss tenderly. While they're still kissing, Ray asks Cloden if he can stay with her for the night. Cloden asks what she is trying to do to him and gives her a gentle kiss on the cheek. He then lifts her up and carries her to the bed. He tells her that since she knows he doesn't have a mother, there's something he has always wanted to try. Ray asks what it is, and Cloden wonders if she can help him with it. She assures him she will do whatever he asks. Cloden explains that, when he was a child, he saw how children would fall asleep while being comforted by their mothers. He's always been curious about that and thanks Ray for being so willing to help him experience it. Ray struggles to think clearly because of the alcohol. She realizes she will lose control if Cloden continues, so she quickly sits up. Cloden kisses her forehead and says that from now on, they will share their drinks. Mary quietly opens the door and peeks inside. Philip walks up and asks what she is doing there, but Mary tells him to keep his voice down. He looks through the door, and seeing Ray and Clodan together, his mouth drops open. Philip tells Mary to go back to her room, warning her that he won't be able to protect her if Clodan finds her. Mary responds that it's quite a sight to see them so close and cozy. She adds that Philip shouldn't tell her he's embarrassed. Philip thinks to himself that it's clear Mary has been alone for a long time. He realizes that since Ray is the only other woman in the castle, Cloden might call on Mary whenever Ray needs something. Philip decides he needs to do something because he suspects Mary has other motives. He thinks that while Mary should show some respect for Cloden, he shuts the door and walks away, hoping that things will stay peaceful for a while. In the room, Ray is crying and pleading. She notices that she has wet the bed. He leans in and gives her a kiss, then tells her she is wet from head to toe and decides to get something to clean her up. Ray wonders to herself why he stopped without going further. She thinks maybe it's because she was drunk or making too much noise, but she decides she is probably overthinking things. Cloden asks her what's wrong. She says she wants to ask him something, and he tells her to go ahead. She asks why he didn't go all the way, and Cloden questions why she wants more. He says that he might next time. Ray explains that's not what she meant. As he cleans her up, he asks if the temperature is okay, and she says it is. 
At night, Ray lies in bed, fast asleep, while Cloden sits nearby. He softly calls her name to see if she's awake, but she doesn't respond. He gently calls her again, but she remains still, lost in her dreams. As he watches her, he thinks to himself that it's sad and unfair. He realizes that if he doesn't even try to hide the curse he carries, she'll have to deal with the madness every day. Cloden worries that if things continue this way, he might end up completely consuming her. He stands up from the bed just as Philip approaches. Philip walks over and asks Cloden if everything is okay. Cloden, seeming impatient, tells Philip that he needs to tie himself down. Philip looks confused and says he doesn't understand what Cloden means. Cloden, clearly frustrated, insists that Philip shouldn't make him repeat himself. Philip quickly agrees and promises to get everything ready. The next morning, Ray wakes up early but finds Cloden missing from the bed and the room. Mary enters, carrying a tray with breakfast. Ray asks Mary where Cloden is. At first, Mary says that Cloden is busy with a lot of things and won't be able to visit. Ray then mentions that Cloden has been acting strangely lately and seemed like he was hiding something the day before. She says she wants to talk to Cloden because she feels he might have answers to her questions. Mary responds that she doesn't know all the details and it might not be good for Ray to seek him out. However, if Ray is determined, Cloden is at the end of the corridor on the second floor. Mary asks Ray to promise that if she senses anything strange, she will turn back and leave immediately. She also tells Ray to make sure she finishes her meal. Ray agrees and thanks Mary, who then leaves, saying she will come back later to check on her. As Ray looks at her meal, she notices a letter tucked underneath the food. The letter has a logo of Skylarks, which is the symbol of the Lisbon family. There aren't many people who know about this symbol. Just Ray, her mother, her cousins, and her brother, Hayes. Ray reads the letter and realizes it's from Hayes because of the way he writes. She starts to wonder if Lady Mary is involved in helping Hayes. However, she remembers that Mary has always ignored Hayes, making it puzzling how he managed to leave the letter under her plate. Ray had thought Hayes would leave her behind and vanish forever. Now, she wonders if Hayes might be waiting for her outside, perhaps in the rain. Ray remembers Hayes calling her names and questioning why she thinks Cloden is interested in her. She hides the letter under a flower vase and thinks about how she had already made up her mind about what to do, even though it's hard for her to leave Hayes behind. She decides that if she sees Hayes again, she will act like she doesn't know him. She hopes he will find happiness and build a family of his own and that they will both fade from each other's memories. Ray knocks on Cloden's door and calls out to him, asking him to open up. When there's no response, she decides to go in anyway. She opens the door and calls his name. As she steps inside, she sees Cloden chained up in a corner. She asks who did this to him and tells him she will get the chains off him right away. Cloden looks at Ray and asks who she thinks is responsible for his chains. Ray asks him why he did this to himself. Cloden explains that he was scared he might lose her because of his own actions. He says that no matter what he does, she always finds him, but she doesn't realize how dangerous it is. She's like a moth drawn to a flame, and that's why he tied himself up. If he didn't, he would go crazy again. Clodon goes on to say that he wants to keep her all to himself, even if it hurts her. Ray clutches her dress and tells him she loves him, which is why she needs to hear the truth from him. She begs him to tell her everything, but he thinks it's pointless. Philip stands by the window, watching the rain fall outside. He worries about what might happen if Clodon ends up hurting Ray since Clodon has been away from the manor for so long. Philip wonders if he could go back in time and change how Clodon turned out, but he figures that Clodon would probably make the same mistakes again. Philip thinks that right now, Ray is the only one who can save Clodon. Still chained up, Cloden asks Ray to come closer. He begs her to release him and let him go, but Ray apologizes and explains that helping him right now would only cause him more pain later. Clodon then says he thought she loved him and wonders if she changed her mind suddenly. Ray reassures him that she still loves him, but she is worried about him. She moves closer to him and pleads with him to stop hurting himself, asking how she can help him. 
As Ray helps him, she avoids looking him in the eye because she's never seen him like this before. Clodon tells her he actually likes it and asks her to go faster. He cries out in response, and she kisses him on the lips. After a while, she decides to wash her hands, but he begs her not to leave. Noticing that Ray seems to be in the mood, Cloden tells her not to be shy, saying it's clear from her face that she wants it. He then asks her to spread her legs, but she says no. Cloden keeps persuading her to spread her legs wider, and eventually she gives in. But when he says he still can't see her properly and needs her to open up more, she insists it might just be his eyesight, or maybe she's just embarrassed. Then he breaks free from the chains and she falls to the floor, fidgeting. Cloden asks where she thinks she's going and tells her not to run away from him. She wonders if he did it on purpose to test her and if pretending to be shackled was part of his plan. He then says that her body seems to be reacting differently and questions whether she's actually into what's happening. He mentions that his excitement isn't the reason for their intimacy. As they continue, she asks why he doesn't seem excited, and he asks if her tears are because of embarrassment, dislike, or love. She stays silent, though the real reason is that he is too deep inside her. He asks if she loves him no matter who he is, and she says yes. She tells him she doesn't care about his actions or her reading ability, because he didn't care about her limitations either. Cloden says it's nothing special, but she disagrees, telling him that it made her very happy. As they're finishing, he suddenly tells her he loves her. She's surprised and asks if she's dreaming, but he confirms she heard him correctly. He then says he's not going to hold back anymore and that she needs to give herself completely to him. When she questions why he's being so demanding, he says he doesn't mind if he breaks her and insists that he loves her. She asks him never to change, and he promises he won't. The next day, Ray is outside, looking lovely in her outfit and glowing with beauty. She mentions how nice the weather is and how everything was set up for her when she decided to go out. She greets John, calling him Mr. Gardener, and he bows in response. She notes that it has been raining a lot lately and thinks the flowers could use some sunlight, to which he agrees. Ray says he doesn't talk much, but she feels oddly at ease with him, especially with everything that's been happening recently. She wonders what Cloden meant when he said he's afraid of losing her and if he's still keeping something from her. Even though he told her he loves her, she still feels anxious because she doesn't know much about him or the palace. She wishes he would just tell her what he's hiding. She offers to help the gardener, and he hands her a watering can. He then shows her a blue rose and explains that it symbolizes happiness. Ray feels confused because she's getting a flower that stands for happiness while she's worried about her own troubles. She thanks John for the flower and says softly that it doesn't matter if the place is strange because there are kind people who care for her. She then asks if he knows the name of the flower, but just as he's about to answer, Cloden arrives and says he's been looking for her. Ray approaches Cloden with concern, asking him directly what's wrong. Cloden, seemingly irritated by her question, notices that she isn't wearing the shoes he had bought for her. He comments on the situation, pointing out that she seems to be smiling over a wilted flower, which he perceives as insignificant. Ray explains that she wants to keep the flowers as long as she can, despite their state, because they hold sentimental value for her. Cloden, clearly annoyed, dismisses her explanation and instructs Philip to remove John from the premises. Ray, feeling the tension and confusion, tries to understand Cloden's reaction and asks if his anger is related to her not wearing the shoes. She explains that she didn't want to wear them out and risk damaging them. Ray acknowledges that she understands Cloden's frustration, but feels that his response is disproportionate to the situation. Cloden's focus then shifts to the wilted flower Ray is holding. She tells him that John gave her the flower to cheer her up, and she insists that Cloden shouldn't be angry about such a simple gesture. Cloden, somewhat perplexed, asks why she is holding on to the flower and what the problem is if it was a kind gesture from John. Ray explains that John's intention was purely kind and that all he did was give her a flower to lift her spirits. She emphasizes that there's no reason for Cloden to be upset over it. Cloden's frustration seems to momentarily soften as he apologizes 
admitting that he feels he can't be as thoughtful as John. He then hesitates before asking if her affection for John's small gesture is causing her to consider breaking up with him. Ray is taken aback by the question. She reassures Cloden that the flower and John's kindness are not reasons for her to end their relationship. She tries to explain that her feelings for Cloden are genuine, and while she appreciates John's gesture, it doesn't mean she wants to leave Cloden. The conversation reveals the depth of Cloden's insecurities, and Ray's struggle to address his concerns without escalating the conflict. Later that night, as they sit down for dinner, the atmosphere in the room is heavy with silence. Cloden, breaking the silence, turns to Mary and instructs her to inform Philip that he knows Philip is hiding someone in the barn. Cloden's tone is firm and commanding as he warns that Philip needs to resolve the situation quickly, or Cloden will handle it himself. Ray is taken aback by Cloden's intense reaction. She struggles to understand why he's making such a fuss over what she perceives as a minor issue. Confused and frustrated, she tells Cloden that she doesn't believe John, the gardener, did anything wrong. She argues that the situation shouldn't be escalated to such extreme measures. Clodan's response is harsh and accusatory. He questions if Ray is planning to harbor John in her room simply because she believes he's innocent. This insinuation only heightens Ray's frustration and feelings of helplessness. She is deeply unsettled by Cloden's attitude and the way he is handling the situation. Feeling overwhelmed and unable to tolerate the tension any longer, Ray decides that she can no longer sit at the table and continue eating with Cloden. She pushes her chair back and stands up, her emotions a mix of anger and resignation. The strained silence at the table speaks volumes, and Ray's decision to leave highlights the deepening rift between her and Cloden. As she walks away, she reflects on the increasingly difficult dynamics of their relationship and the mounting pressure that seems to be driving them further apart. As she starts to leave the room, Mary quickly follows her, asking her to wait and try to calm down. She gently tries to get Ray to stop and take a moment to collect her thoughts. Ray, clearly upset, explains her frustration. She doesn't understand why Cloden is making such a big deal out of something she views as trivial. It seems to her that Cloden is constantly looking for reasons to blame her for things that aren't her fault, which only fuels her anger. Ray expresses her frustration by saying that Cloden must be so consumed with jealousy and love for her that even the smallest issues provoke his wrath. She wishes he would just openly admit to being jealous instead of letting these emotions simmer beneath the surface. Ray feels that Clodon always finds faults in situations that could be resolved with straightforward, honest communication. She recounts an incident from the previous day when Clodon had pushed her hand away after professing his love for her. This action left Ray questioning why he can't be honest with her about his true feelings. She had anticipated that being in love would bring happiness and joy into her life, but instead, it feels like an overwhelming burden. The constant tension and emotional strain are making it difficult for her to understand why loving Cloden has become so challenging. Ray's frustration is palpable as she confides in Mary, struggling with the emotional weight of her relationship. She feels trapped in a cycle of misunderstanding and conflict, where love seems to come with more complications than she ever imagined. The emotional turmoil has left her feeling lost and unsure of how to navigate the complexities of her relationship with Cloden. John tells them to stay away from him as Philip tries to move him. Mary says they should just send him out instead. When asked if she's willing to leave with John, she says if they kick him out, Cloden and Ray will never fix their issues. But John doesn't care about that. As John leans forward to be taken away, Mary slaps his hand and then asks Philip if he realizes he could be next in line to leave if John goes, with the barn owner following, and then Mary herself. Mary questions who will be left in the manor in ten years, Cloden or Ray. Philip, frustrated with the escalating situation, tells Mary to stay out of it, asserting that there's no chance they could ever... Mary interrupts him abruptly, arguing that it's better to address the issue now than to face a future where Cloden might be dragging Ray's lifeless body around in ten years. Her words carry a chilling weight, emphasizing the urgency and severity of the situation. 
Philip, taken aback, asks Mary what she suggests they do. He points out that there's no place to hide from Cloden within the manor, and wonders who will suffer if they end up getting caught in the crossfire. He argues that it's not their problem, and that they shouldn't involve themselves in the personal struggles of Cloden and Ray. Mary counters Philip's reluctance by explaining that if it were just any couple, the situation might not be as critical. However, with Cloden and Ray, the stakes are much higher. She describes their relationship as a volatile situation, where any misstep could exacerbate the problems. Mary notes that Ray has expressed how Cloden is becoming increasingly difficult to manage, implying that the situation is rapidly deteriorating. Mary delves deeper into the emotional dynamics, explaining that when people's expectations are shattered, it leads to a profound shift in their emotions. Hope can quickly turn into despair, and love can transform into hatred. This intense emotional upheaval often causes people to lose their sense of sanity and stability. She underscores the severity of the consequences if their issues are not addressed, suggesting that the situation could spiral out of control if they don't take action. Philip listens, absorbing Mary's perspective. Her insights make him reconsider the gravity of the situation and the potential ramifications if they remain passive. Mary's words linger in his mind as he contemplates the potential fallout and the impact on everyone involved. Philip remains silent for a moment, prompting Mary to insist that he listen to her for once. She emphasizes that, despite their imperfections, they have managed to buy themselves a few days of relative calm. She asks Philip for his thoughts on the situation. Philip sighs deeply and admits that he's uncertain about the outcome, but speculates that if they're fortunate, they might get three days of peace before any new issues arise. Meanwhile, at the dining table, Mary stands behind Clodon and Ray, holding a teapot. She mutters to herself, noting that Clodon and Ray haven't spoken a word to each other throughout the meal. Clodon, attempting to break the silence, requests more sauce for both of their plates. Mary acknowledges his request with a polite, Yes, master, but when Ray is asked if she would like some sauce, she declines. Clodon, growing frustrated, slams his hand on the table, his anger evident. He insists that Ray should do as she wishes, clearly irritated by her refusal. Ray, taken aback by his reaction, comments that there's no need to slam the table so forcefully. Cloden's irritation only grows, and he questions if her annoyance extends to his actions as well. Ray responds that she doesn't want to hear his complaints, adding to the tension in the room. Cloden, feeling cornered and defensive, tells Ray that if she is so unhappy, she should just leave. He accuses her of blaming him for her dissatisfaction, which only escalates the argument. The atmosphere at the dining table becomes charged with unresolved emotions, and the underlying tension between Cloden and Ray continues to build. Ray thanks Mary for the dinner and leaves the dining area. Later, Mary knocks on Ray's door and enters her room. When Ray asks what she needs, Mary places a cup of tea and a piece of paper on the table. Ray looks at the paper and asks why Mary brought it. Mary explains that writing down her feelings might help her process everything. Ray wonders if Cloden asked Mary to bring the paper. Mary shakes her head and assures Ray that Cloden did not make her do this. Despite Mary's reassurance, Ray doubts that Cloden would even read what she writes. She imagines he might become angry and tear it up instead. Mary encourages Ray not to think negatively and reminds her of how deeply Cloden loves her. As they talk, there's a knock on the door. Philip walks in, bowing politely to greet Lady Ray. He hands her a letter from Master Cloden. Philip explains that if Ray wishes to write a response, she can leave it under the vase next to the staircase, just as he mentioned before. Ray takes the letter and looks at Philip, her expression a mix of curiosity and apprehension. Philip nods reassuringly before leaving the room, giving Ray some privacy to read the letter and consider her response. As the door closes behind him, Ray sits down with the letter, her mind racing with thoughts and emotions. Mary decides to excuse herself from the situation and leaves, while Philip tells her to inform him if she needs anything. Once Mary has departed, Philip and Mary continue their discussion in the hallway. Mary observes that their plan appears to have worked for now. Philip agrees, but expresses some unease noting that it's odd because Cloden must have caught on to at least part of their scheme. 
Mary is curious and asks Philip how he knows this. Philip admits that he isn't entirely sure how Cloden discovered their intentions, but he notes that Cloden hasn't mentioned anything directly. What strikes Philip as particularly strange is that Master Cloden personally painted a yellow rose on the letter. He finds it unusual and wonders if this detail indicates that Cloden has a deeper understanding of their plan than they initially thought. Mary takes a moment to reflect on the situation. She agrees that, regardless of Cloden's awareness, the most important thing is that their plan has been successful so far and that no one has been harmed in the process. She feels confident that Master Clodon is genuinely interested in making amends with Lady Ray. This belief reassures her, and she tells Philip that they can afford to relax a little now. However, Philip remains cautious. He understands that although things seem to be settling down, the situation might not stay calm for long. He is aware that there are still potential challenges and complications ahead. Philip knows from experience that in situations like these, the peace they've managed to achieve could be fragile and subject to change. He prepares himself for the possibility that their efforts might face new obstacles and that they need to stay vigilant. In the letter, Cloden asks Ray when she plans to return the book she borrowed. He mentions that he remembers everything that is his, and just by looking at the empty space on his bookshelf, he knows what's missing. He reminds her of the secret place he showed her and says he never mistreats things he cherishes, and he wouldn't share them with anyone. He then wonders if he's the strange one for feeling this way. Ray isn't pleased with the letter because she was hoping for an apology. She questions why he's making excuses about the book and wonders if this is how things will be from now on. Deciding to show him she sees through his games, she writes him back. In her letter, she apologizes if her spelling is off, as it's her first time writing a letter. She says she remembers the book well. It was when they first spoke. She acknowledges that the things he keeps are important to him, but insists that she is not just an object that can be tucked away. Ray writes in her letter that getting a flower doesn't mean much to her because her heart was always his to keep. She explains that when she received the yellow flower, her thoughts were entirely consumed by him. She admits to feeling overwhelmed by her own confusion and the effort it takes to understand him. Despite her struggles, all she does is think about him and yearn for his presence. Ray confesses that she's been waiting, hoping he would come to understand her feelings and the depth of her affection. In the letter, Ray acknowledges that she isn't the most perceptive or intelligent, but her feelings for him are genuine and intense. She wonders aloud if he really believes she became upset with him just because she was angry. Her emotions are raw and sincere as she pens these words, hoping they convey the truth of her heart. After finishing the letter, Ray carefully steps out of her room, clutching the paper in her hand. She makes her way to the designated spot, a place where he had asked her to leave the letter. With a sense of purpose, she places the letter under the verse, exactly where he had requested. The next day, Ray finds another letter waiting for her, accompanied by a yellow rose. As she reads Cloden's new message, she feels a mixture of anticipation and curiosity. In his letter, Cloden expresses his desire to hear her say that she loves him. He asks her to meet him where the yellow roses are, saying he will be waiting for her there. As she finishes reading the letter, Ray reflects on the significance of the yellow roses and the personal connections people have to things they love. She realizes that everyone has something or someone they hold dear, and she's come to understand that for her, it is Clodan. The thought brings a mix of comfort and excitement as she prepares to meet him, eager to express her feelings and share this important moment with him. Ray reflects on the influences of those around her. Her mother had a deep appreciation for wealth and honor. Her father was devoted to his business, and Hayes was known for his love of fine clothes and his sense of dignity. Each had their own passion, which shaped their lives in different ways. Now, Ray finds herself at a crossroads, feeling the need to discover what she truly wants and to make definitive choices about her own life. She's bewildered by her emotions, feeling a profound internal conflict that she can't quite explain. Despite this confusion, she finds herself drawn back to Cloden whenever he expresses that he misses her. 
She arrives at the spot where the yellow roses grow and is overwhelmed by a complex mix of emotions. The feeling is unfamiliar and a little painful, but Ray senses that it's genuine. As she stands there, trying to grasp the nature of this new emotion, Cloden calls out to her. His voice is filled with warmth as he tells her he loves her. He seems to understand that she needed to hear those words, and she responds by embracing him tightly. In that moment, as she feels his arms around her, Ray comes to the realization that this might be what love truly is. Later, in the privacy of their room, Ray and Cloden are sharing a tender kiss. The intimacy between them deepens as Cloden begins to take things further. Ray, however, asks him to pause for a moment. Concerned, Cloden asks if something is wrong. Ray shakes her head and reassures him that everything is fine. With a gentle, determined expression, she sits on top of him and tells Cloden that she will take the lead and handle everything. Her voice is steady and filled with a sense of purpose. As she prepares to guide their intimacy, Ray feels a new sense of empowerment and clarity about her role in their relationship. Philip instructs Jack to take some food to John in the dungeon. As Jack reluctantly heads off to carry out the task, Philip grumbles to himself about the butler lamenting how he always seems to be the one running all the errands. Philip feels the weight of his responsibilities, including managing tasks he finds tiresome. When Philip arrives at the dungeon, he sets down the food and picks up a piece of bread for himself. He surveys John, who is sitting in the dim, cold cell, and reflects on why John might be locked up. Philip doubts that the punishment is solely because of the flowers John damaged. He speculates that there might be more to the story, perhaps something involving theft. Philip tries to ease the tension by sharing that he understands the challenges of living as a noble with people constantly scheming and trying to undermine him. He empathizes with John, who is now facing a harsh punishment. John insists that he hasn't stolen anything, maintaining his innocence. Philip acknowledges the severity of the situation, questioning whether it's truly fair to impose such a harsh penalty over a matter of money. Seeing an opportunity to help John and to satisfy his own curiosity, Philip asks John for a favor. He wants John to check whether the flowers are still alive. Philip is genuinely interested in finding out the condition of the flowers and hopes that John can provide some insight. He feels a sense of responsibility towards John and wants to offer support, even if it's in a small way. As Philip waits for John's response, he remains concerned about the fairness of the situation and the broader implications of their actions. John agrees to Philip's request, saying that he doesn't have anything else to do at the moment and feels he owes Philip for his previous help. As they discuss this, Ray and Cloden share an intimate moment. Ray takes the lead at first, guiding their encounter with confidence and affection. After some time, Cloden gently takes over, and their connection deepens as they both openly confess their love for each other. Their bond grows stronger as they share their feelings, becoming even more emotionally close. Meanwhile, Philip and Mary make their way to the dungeon, where they find John. Philip tells John to come out and hands him a coat to put on, Mary then explains that their master has decided that John should return to work starting the next day. She adds that John should refrain from speaking to Ray in the future. Although Mary understands that John might feel lonely, she advises him not to depend on Ray for emotional support. She makes it clear that he should focus on his duties and not seek comfort from her. As they prepare to leave, Jack, who is nearby, hands John a yellow flower. He mentions that all the flowers are still alive and that he kept his promise. Jack adds that John should stop bothering him since he wants to get some rest. As Mary and John walk away, Mary asks John if he knows what yellow roses symbolize. John thinks for a moment and guesses that it represents jealousy. Mary's expression is unreadable as they continue their way, leaving John to ponder the significance of the flower and its message. Philip tells Cloden that he didn't quite catch what he said and asks him to repeat. Cloden says again that the place is too small. Philip wonders if Cloden means the manor, but Cloden says they need to build an annex and asks what Philip thinks. Philip still doesn't get why Cloden is asking this, but he thinks it makes sense given how Cloden grew up. 
Philip remembers that Cloden's grandfather once told him to start work right away. Cloden's grandfather was a lord from a young age and always wanted to start a family. He had an arranged marriage and didn't care much for his wife, but when she had their first child, he became much more loving. The birth of his son meant the Lord would spend more time at home instead of being out all the time. Cloden's grandfather brought peace to the family, but after experiencing fatherhood, he wanted even more and hoped for a second child. However, that didn't happen easily. His wife was sick and weak, so having another baby was out of the question. Their relationship, which had been getting better, became distant again. Despite the disappointment, their only son, who would inherit the title, grew up to be a remarkable man. Edmund Cassilier, Cloden's father, tells his own father that he is done with his schooling. His father picks him up and lifts him high into the air. Edmund finishes his schooling in the city with outstanding grades, earning praise for his academic achievements. When he returns home, his parents are eager for him to get engaged, and he agrees to marry a woman they have chosen for him. However, soon after, a serious issue arises. Edmund's father is visibly frustrated and slams his hand on the table during a heated argument. He is upset, because Edmund has announced that he cannot live without the woman he loves, who is not the one his parents had selected. His father questions whether Edmund truly believes that his personal feelings are a valid reason to break off the engagement and replace his fiancée with someone entirely different. He argues that the woman Edmund is infatuated with is not from a noble family. Her father is merely a poor artist. His father warns that such a match will lead to gossip and judgment from their social circles, which could tarnish the family's reputation. Edmund, however, dismisses his father's concerns. He doesn't see the social implications as a problem at all. When his father presses him further, Edmund firmly responds that he would rather face the consequences of societal judgment and criticism than live a life constrained by what others think. His passion for the woman he loves outweighs any concern about public opinion. Reluctantly, his parents have no choice but to accept the marriage. They are visibly disappointed, but their objections are overruled. Edmund, on the other hand, embraces his married life with joy and contentment. He is indifferent to his parents' unhappiness and remains focused on the happiness he finds in his relationship, unfazed by the societal expectations or the judgment of others. This all happens around the time when Philip finally gains the family's trust. It's a rainy August day, right in the middle of the monsoon season. The rain falls steadily, creating a soothing rhythm outside as a new life begins inside. A baby is born, and Edmund suggests naming him Cloden in honor of his late grandfather. He asks if his father would like to hold the baby. The newborn has his mother's amber-colored eyes, which are bright and full of life. The baby's arrival brings a lot of joy and, for a time, helps mend the strained relationship between father and son. However, this happiness is short-lived. Soon after the baby's birth, a highly infectious disease begins to spread rapidly through the village. The illness moves quickly, causing panic and grief as it takes the lives of the boy's grandparents. The loss hits hard, and before anyone can even fully grasp the gravity of the situation, the disease claims the lives of his parents as well. All of this occurs when Cloden is just four years old. Suddenly, the young child is thrust into the role of Lord, a position he is far too young to fully understand. Despite his tender age, Cloden shows remarkable resilience and capability. He takes on his new responsibilities with a surprising degree of skill and maturity. Every tutor he encounters is impressed by his abilities and praises him highly. The people at the manor, seeing his dedication and talent, begin to take pride in him, marveling at how well he handles the weight of his new role. Philip approaches Cloden and mentions that he heard Cloden turned the maid away again today. He notes that as Cloden gets older, he seems to be displaying unusual behavior. Cloden has always had a tendency to be very particular. He doesn't like anyone in his room except for his nanny. Philip remembers times when Cloden found a dessert he enjoyed and insisted on eating just that one thing every day for a whole month. There was even a period when Cloden wore the same set of clothes every day for three months straight. 
Philip realizes that Cloden has a strong tendency to become intensely focused on things he likes, whether it's food, clothes, or other material items. Recently, Philip has noticed that this fixation isn't just about objects, it extends to Lady Ray as well. Philip is starting to understand that Cloden's obsession with Lady Ray is just another example of his overall pattern of intense focus. Meanwhile in the kitchen, Mary watches Philip closely and asks what's on his mind. She wonders if he's feeling disgusted or if something is bothering him. Mary's tone suggests she's curious about Philip's thoughts and is concerned about his reaction. Philip says sorry, but Mary keeps pushing him. She asks if he's worried that Cloden is totally fixated on Lady Ray. Philip says he thinks Lady Ray is too gentle and Clodon is too intense. He also mentions that he's unsure about Clodon's sudden choice to build an annex. Mary tells him he's just saying what everyone already knows and warns him to stay out of it, pointing at his face. She then questions why it matters so much if a lonely young woman falls in love with their master. Isn't that what they've all wanted? For Cloden and Lady Ray to fall in love? Philip doesn't say anything, and Mary tells him not to make her angry. She says she needs to go deliver Lady Ray's meal. Philip starts to think he might be wrong and wonders about Mary's attitude. Maybe it's nothing, just like Mary said. He figures that since Cloden and Lady Ray are in love, everything will turn out fine. Enjoying this recap so far? Comment Cloden below for part three. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, ciao!